We're in John chapter 20. We're coming towards the tail end of uh, the Gospel of John. This week we're going to see Jesus appear to Doubting Thomas. Next week we're going to see Jesus' post-resurrection appearance uh, to, the, uh, uh, to uh, Peter and restoring Peter to leadership. Good stuff in these post-resurrection appearances. Some lessons on faith. And so today we're going to learn, we're going to learn some lessons on faith from Doubting Thomas, learning from Doubting Thomas. Now, first of all, I think uh, Thomas gets a bad rap a little bit. I think that uh, Thomas, uh, uh, throughout the ages, I'm glad I didn't uh, get uh, put in scriptures Doubting John or something, you know? But he gets a, he, or it's not in scriptures, that's his nickname we've, we've given to him. But uh, I'm glad through the ages I didn't get that bum rap either. Because I think Thomas, Thomas was a man of God. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Thomas was a man that um, uh, Jesus prayed all night before picking as one of the apostles. We know that from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus spent a night praying through the whole night before he picked Thomas as one of his, one of his apostles. We know that Thomas was the one when Jesus talked about going back to the Jerusalem area when there was all these religious leaders that wanted to kill him. Other disciples were saying in John chapter 11, they were saying, you know, we don't want to go back there. Are you sure, Jesus, you want to go back to Jerusalem? They want to kill you there. Remember what Thomas said? John chapter 11, verse 6. Thomas said, let us also go so that we might die with him. Thomas said, hey, I'm willing to go back to, if Jesus goes to Jerusalem, we're going to go. And if we have to die with him, we'll die with him. But Thomas was a practical, practical guy that had questions and he was a realist too. Uh, John chapter 14, remember Jesus was declaring that, you know, I'm going, disciples, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there's many dwelling places. And then Jesus said something like this. He said, and where I'm going, you know where I'm going, and you know the way I'm going. And you remember what Thomas said? Thomas, all the other disciples were saying, whoa, whatever. But Thomas said this in John chapter 14. He said, um, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And I'm glad Thomas asked that. Because Jesus made a great statement after Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. Remember what Jesus said? Great statement. John 14, 6. I am. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Glad Thomas asked that. Good question, Thomas. We don't know where you're going. Where you're going? What is the way? And then Jesus could declare, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Good stuff. And you know what? Questions aren't bad. Questions aren't bad. It's okay, especially when you're having a crisis of faith like Thomas. Thomas had just witnessed the death of his Savior, the Messiah. He had questions. He was in a crisis of faith, and questions are good. Questions are legitimate. Questions are okay. Let me newsflash. God can handle your questions. And God would rather you be venting questions rather than just walking away from your relationship with him because you're disillusioned or disappointed. Psalms, David, over and over again the Psalms. In the midst of running from Saul, in the midst of all the crises that he went through, he asked questions. And you see the Psalms over and over again. He, asked, he was a man after God's own heart, but he asked questions. And as he asked those questions, God, through the Spirit, gave him some answers. And he went from questions to faith and hope again throughout the Psalms. Questions are okay. God can handle your questions. Mary and Martha, back to the story of Lazarus, when their brother died. Mary and Martha said, Lord, where were you? If you'd been here, he, he might not, you know, Lord, he, they had questions for Jesus. And then Jesus can answer their questions and say, I am. I'm the resurrection of life. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You know what? He answered their questions. But it started with their questions. Questions are okay. You know, I believe that probably uh, Paul had some questions. As he had that thorn in the flesh. And he prayed three times for the Lord to take the thorn in the flesh away. And God didn't. There were some questions there. But again, God answered the, the questions and said, Paul, my grace will be sufficient. And in your weakness, my power will be made manifest. So those questions were answered. But there was questions. And that's okay. It's legitimate to have questions. Especially when life is tough. Crises happen. Circumstances are bad. Ask God questions. Pray out those questions. And that's okay. It's legitimate. God can handle it. I remember when I first got saved, the guy that was witnessing to me, Bruce Barkley and everything else, he kind of discipled me after I got saved. And I, I just, man, I was wearing him out with questions. I remember asking him questions. And when I saw him, you know, serendipitously, we saw him on this 30-year uh, anniversary, we kind of went back to some of those questions I had in my beginning year, especially after I came to Christ. Because I remember, I, 
came out of this liberal background, and I thought the Bible was, had contradictions and everything else. And even after I came to Christ, I remember asking Bruce, how, how can you say this book doesn't have any mistakes? It was written over a 1,500-year period on you know, three different continents. How could all these authors just not have any mistakes in this book? And then he would just be patient with me and graceful and just say, hey, it's inspired, John. It's not written by all those men. It's written by God, and it's God-breathed. And he'd answer my questions, and I'd ask him more questions. Yeah, right, it's antiquated, it's 2,000 years old. How can I not have a say? And he just would work with me on that. And you know what? As I got into the Word, and I studied the Word more, I realized he was right. And he's right. This book is inerrant. There's not a, one mistake in the whole thing. All 66 books inspired, God breathed. Its unity is beautiful from Genesis to Revelation. I just needed to study some more. I need to get into it some more. And yeah, those questions were answered. This book is inerrant, infallible, inspired by God. There's not, the more I study it, the more I'm convinced of that. So it's, but it's okay to have those questions, right? And so we're going to see Thomas doubting a little bit, having some questions, but we're going to see him make a great statement today, too, of the deity of Jesus Christ. So you ready to get into a church? Let's, let's dive right in. Post-resurrection appearance of Thomas, or of Jesus to Thomas. Uh, John chapter 20. Verse 24, if you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus. Now, first of all, he was Didymus, was his nickname. The word Didymus is twin, which means he probably either had a twin brother or a twin sister. He was a twin. But also it says, but Thomas, but Thomas. How many parents have you said, but John or but whatever your kid's name is? All right, oh, but, here we go. But Thomas. One of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. Now, interesting, first of all, Thomas missed the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ. Go back, just a few verses. It was the first Sunday, it was, it was Resurrection Sunday, verse 19. So it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. They missed that. Thomas missed that. Why? Probably because he was having a crisis of faith. He's probably at that point saying, you know, those guys will meet again. They'll be praying again, and they're together in the upper room, but I ain't going to go there. I'm fed up with this. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to believe anymore. And what did he miss when they gathered? The appearance of Jesus Christ. First post-resurrection appearance. And he missed Jesus in that upper room. Now, I want to, I want to bring this out because I want to tell you something. When believers, disciples gather in Jesus' name, what does Jesus promise? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there in their midst. And so what we see here is we don't want to miss gathering together as disciples of Jesus Christ. Because what happens when we gather together? Jesus shows up. And I feel every time we, I hear at Calvary Chapel, it felt it this morning, God's presence. The presence of Jesus is in this place because he promises it. And so don't be one of those Christians that say, well, it's raining outside. I ain't going to go to church. Had a long week, need to sleep in and just make some pancakes, forget about church. Why would you do that? This is where Jesus meets us with his people. When the disciples gather, Jesus is here. Why would you want to miss out on that? You know, I, I've heard some people, well, the football season started again, and I was uh, my favorite football teams are on. How could I miss that? You can miss that. That's what DVRs are for. Record it or something. Don't miss the gathering of God's people because that's where Jesus meets with us. There's power in that. And I get that of not wanting to come to church because I grew up as a kid going to a dead church. And the dead church had the oh, stone walls and had the organ and the choir that didn't want to be there either. And you just walked in and everybody's like this and they're just going through the motions and it's ritual and it was boring. I mean boring. And I, I remember going to, as a, every Sunday where I was forced to go until I was like a teenager, and I'd go, I don't want to be there because nobody else wants to be there either. But then I got saved. And when I came to Christ, it's amazing because I found some churches that were alive. They're actually believing in this book, and they were teaching this book. 
And the worship was in spirit and truth. And my whole thing changed. Part of it was I had the spirit of God and I wanted things of the spirit. But part of it, as I found the right churches to go to that were alive and on fire for Christ, and I didn't want to miss it. I remember there was a church that was on fire an hour away from our house. And through my college years, I drove an hour on Sundays to go to that church because, man, Jesus was there. And it was present. And it was powerful. And I was, I was going Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And I remember Dr. Dave, the guy that mentored me, the Bible college professor, he had a Friday night Bible study. I wasn't going to miss that when I was home during the summertime because I felt powerfully the presence of Jesus as the word of God was opened up and the spirit was, we'd worship on Friday nights too. I was going Sunday mornings, Wednesday night, Friday nights for years because I wanted to be with the disciples of Jesus because we were meeting with Jesus. How could you miss that church? How would, why would you want to miss that? Because church is where you meet with Jesus. Amen. And Thomas missed out because he wasn't gathered with the disciples. Don't miss out. Be a part of church because this is where we meet with Jesus. And Thomas missed that. But no, verse 25 goes, so the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, this is for eight days or for the whole next week. He was going to have to take this stance. I'm not believing. And I could just see other disciples like Peter or John or James or whoever saying, Thomas, we saw the Lord. We saw his sword-pierced side. We saw his nail-pierced hands. We saw him. And I bet you they reiterated that all week long. It was a long week for Thomas. And as they reiterated that, I could just see Thomas saying, I'm not going to believe. Not going to believe. Not going to believe. And you know what? He wanted some evidence. Now, here's one, another point on faith. Not only is when gather, believers gather together, we meet with Jesus, we experience presence of Jesus, but another lesson on faith is this. God is not only not afraid of your questions, God wants to give us evidence sometimes. He's going to have a personal appearance to Thomas to give him evidence. And he's going to give him the evidence of his nail-pierced hands and his sword-pierced side because that's what Thomas asked for. And God will give us evidence too. Do you know that? If you, if you look apologetically just at the resurrection and do some work on that, you'll find some evidence in the validity of your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know that Christians were initially Jewish Christians? They were, they were Jewish believers that came to Christ. And when did they meet from the first century on? Did they meet on the Saturday, which for millennials, thousands of years, the Jewish believers met on? No. What day of the week did they meet on? They switched to Sunday, to worship. We see that right here. They're gathered in the upper room on the first day of the week. And, and as they gathered, what happened? Jesus met post-resurrection appearance. And from that time forward, we see through the scriptures, they started meeting on Sundays. Why? Because that's when Jesus appeared to them on their very first Sunday. How do I know that? Scripture tells us that. Um, give you some examples. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. It says, on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. The first day of the week, it says, when we gather together to do what? They're gathering together to, for communion, for worship, to break bread. Amazing. It says, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. You think I'm long-winded? He taught till midnight. Remember, this is the story where Eutychus was sitting on the window cell, a young man, and he started getting tired and fell asleep and fell out the second story window and died. And Paul had to go heal him and bring him back to life. I'm glad I'm not the only one that people fall asleep to. You know, I see some of you on Sundays, yeah? <laughs> I see some of you, yeah, you're getting it, John. You're listening, but other people are like, oh, I go, that person must have had a rough night last night. But they, they were meeting and breaking bread when? On the first day of the week. Some other examples. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of the week, every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as you may prosper so that no collections may be made when I come. We see there, they gathered together on the first day of the week and they took offerings. Now, question. Why would believers, Jewish believers in Christ, changed their day of worship from Saturday to Sunday after thousands of years of making their day of worship Saturday. And we saw in Revelation, where we studied the book of Revelation, Men's Breakfast, a couple of Saturdays ago, it says that, that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day was Sunday. 
because it was the day he rose from the grave. So what's my point? Evidence for the resurrection is just in the fact that Jewish believers would change their day of worship after thousands of years from Saturday to Sunday because something very, very, very significant happened on that first Sunday. And what was that? Jesus rose from the grave. And so they said, we want to worship Jesus on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And I could see disciples like Thomas that had post-resurrection appearances, the apostles, the other witnesses of the resurrection, when they worshiped on Sunday from that day forward, they probably had in their minds a clear picture of the resurrected Christ. And boy, that helped their worship, didn't it? There's evidence behind the resurrection. There's also evidence uh, that, that of just witnesses. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read about the witnesses of the resurrection. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. If you don't have Bibles, it's up on the screen. Let's read it together. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And after that, he appeared to Cyphus, then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James. James was his brother. And then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared, Paul says, to me also. You want evidence for your faith, just as Thomas wanted evidence? Go back to the resurrection. And the resurrection had 500 people see Jesus in his post-resurrection state. How many people do we need today to arrest somebody and put him in jail for the rest of his life? Two to three witnesses. Paul said, I got 500. Most of them are still living right now. I'll come up with them right now if you want me to. And these people will verify the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We got evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We got evidence for our faith. And listen, church, if you need some bolstering of your faith, it's important, do some apologetic stuff. Read some books on the evidences for Christianity. I'll give you some good references if you want them. First of all, one of the best books written on apologetics for the evidences for our faith, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Another one, um, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. Written decades ago, but still a great read. Short read, but it points to the evidences of Christ's resurrection, evidences for our faith. And then if you want like an encyclopedia for evidences for our faith, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell, the same author of More Than a Carpenter. And it's good. It's good to do some apologetic research like that because it bolsters your faith. One of the speakers we're going to have for the men's conference this year is Charlie Campbell. And I regularly had Charlie Campbell speak for me here at this church because he gives evidences apologetically over a whole country. He speaks like Calvary Chapels over the whole country saying this is the evidences behind what we believe. We don't believe, as Peter said, we don't believe in cleverly devised tales. Peter said we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. When? At the resurrection. So the resurrection has evidences, and God's okay with us needing some evidences, just so he gives evidences to Thomas. I believe he gives evidences to us in the validity of the resurrection. Now let's go on. <clears throat> Thomas is saying, hey, ain't, I ain't going to believe till I see his nail-pierced hands and sword-pierced I ain't going to believe what happens. Verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside. Now when it says after eight days, that's a way of saying in that culture and that time, after eight days means a week later because it's after eight days. So this is a week later. So when does he appear again if it's seven days later? The next Sunday night. Interesting. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, and the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And I could see all the other disciples looking over, Thomas. I, I could just see it. I don't know if they said it verbally. I could just see in their hearts them saying, I told you so. Don't you hate it when people say that to you? Especially other Christians. I told you so. Spouses, how many times has your spouse said, I told you so, should have believed, right? And that's what they're, they're looking over, I believe, probably to Thomas. Jesus, just like a week earlier, appears and says, hey, peace be with you. I want you to see something here, though, very important. 
Thomas is in a crisis of faith. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I see the, see the nail pierced hands and the sword pierced hands. I don't, I'm not going to believe. But the disciples are gathering together. Where's Thomas at? Look at this. Where's Thomas at? He's gathered with the believers again. And that's important for us to see because you could say what he said the week before. Done. I'm not going to meet with you guys. You guys go ahead and meet, but I'm not going to be in fellowship anymore because this thing is just let burst my balloon. I'm not going to go with it anymore. But he didn't do that. He got himself back in fellowship. And where's he going to meet Jesus again? Look at that. In fellowship. Fellowship. Here's the, here's the tendency. When we have crisis of faith, when we have struggles with our faith, when we have doubts, when we have things we're struggling with, here's what we, our tendency to do is just fall out of fellowship. Is that smart? No, because again, fellowship is where you're going to meet with Jesus again. Let us consider, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Notice what it says, not forsaking our own assembling as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Do you see that? As iron sharpens iron, so we sharpen one another. We gotta be in fellowship. It's so important. That stimulates us to love and good deeds. It stimulates in our faith. It's sharpening the effect of fellowship, that sharpening effect it has on us. And especially when we're struggling with faith, get yourself back in fellowship because that's where you're gonna meet with Jesus again and that faith is gonna be resolved and be strengthened again. You know, I remember my sophomore year in college, I had a tough first couple years of, of college I went to University of Illinois on a scholarship, athletic scholarship. I got injured my freshman year. I had a, I had a red shirt my sophomore year because of a torn rotator cuff. And I remember I just got kind of disillusioned. Part of it was I had such good fellowship in high school. I mean, we had a community of believers in high school that were just, man, we were on fire. There was revival in our school. There was people coming to Christ all over the place. And then I went from that to a university with 45,000 students and the biggest fraternity and sorority place in the country, University of Illinois. It was a mess. And I was on this gymnastics team where everybody was partiers, and I was the solo Christian. And it was a struggle. It's a real struggle. And then on my sophomore year of fall semester, I had one of those situations where I just backslid. I just struggled in my faith to the point that, man, I was just going back to the world in a lot of areas that I said I'd never go back to. And then I remember coming home for Christmas break, getting back in fellowship with that close-knit group of believers at Dr. Dave's Bible study and, and being back in the Word and stuff. And the Lord laid on my heart, when you go back to University of Illinois after this Christmas break, you need to change some things. You need to get back in fellowship. And the Lord laid in my heart. The Lord said, and don't try to let it come to you. You want some friends, prove yourself friendly. Get back in fellowship. I did. And I got involved. <laughs> I almost overdid it. I got involved in FCA. I got involved with um, a Campus Crusade. I got involved with Baptist Student Union. I got involved with the Bible Church and got discipled in the Bible Church. Man, I was, my, my major was social work in undergrad. And it became social life because I got so much fellowship going. It was awesome. Because you know what happened? I stopped the backsliding, and I started going forward again with Christ. And I got around some Christians that actually discipled me and helped me and stirred up that flame in my heart again for Christ. That's what we need to do, especially when we're struggling. We need to be in fellowship. It stimulates us. It helps us. It strengthens us. It gets our faith going again. As iron sharpens iron, we sharpen one another. Amen? So notice that. He's back in fellowship. He's with the disciples. He's, and Jesus shows up. And then it says in verse 27, and then Jesus says to Thomas, reach here your finger. See my hands. Reach here your hand. Put it into my side. <laughs> Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, it doesn't say Thomas did that, but I think he might have. And can you imagine? So I'm not going to believe unless I get to put my finger through his nail pressed hands and I get to put my hand through his hair pressed. Jesus is all of a sudden, notice the doors are locked again too. The doors are shut. And all of a sudden, poof! Jesus poofs right in. And he says, peace be with you. And if I was Thomas, I'd say, ooh, I don't know about peace. And then Jesus says, Thomas, come over here. Come over here. Take your finger. 
put it in my nail pierced hand. Take your hand, put it in my sword pierced side. Now, it doesn't say he did it, but if Jesus tells you to do something like that, you're probably going to do it. And I could just see, taking that finger, wow, feeling the hole and putting it through his hand. And then taking his hand and putting it through the hole in his side. Wow. And look at Thomas's response. Go back. Look at Thomas's response. Thomas answered, and said to Jesus, my Lord. And notice what he says. What? My God. It's one of the clearest statements of the deity of Christ in the entire Bible. Now, get me on this. All throughout the New Testament, we're told that Jesus is God. But he's, he, he, he's just laying it out there. He's just saying, my Lord and my God. God. And notice he doesn't say, you are Lord and you are God. What does he say? My Lord, my God. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that Jesus isn't God. Don't let any group out there on bicycles or white shirts or black ties tell you that he's just a son of God like we're sons of God. What does it say? My Lord and my God. All throughout the New Testament, we're told Jesus Christ is not only the Lord, he's God. Very, very first verse of this book we're studying. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Several other instances, Paul talking about Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says this, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great, what? God and Savior, who's who? Jesus Christ. Paul was very clear on the point. Jesus is our God and Savior. Also, interesting, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, said this, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority, before all time, now and forever, amen. And then listen to this, even the Father declares the Son is God. Hebrews 1.8 says this, but of the Son, God says, talking about the Father, says, your throne Talking about the Son, what does the Father say? Your throne what? Oh, God. That's speaking the Father, speaking about the Son. Your throne, oh, God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So all throughout the Scriptures, we're told that Jesus is God and Savior. And now, listen to what Jesus says in response to Thomas declaring him uh, Lord and God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Now notice, does Jesus say, oh, Thomas, you ain't got your theology right here. I'm a divine messenger, I'm a prophet, I'm a great teacher, but I ain't God. Don't worship me, I'm just a man. Is that what Jesus says? No, he says, Thomas, you've seen and you've believed, and that's good, but blessed are those who don't see and yet they believe. And you know who 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 that's directed to? Who's that talking to? Us, right here. How many people have believed here without having to see Jesus physically? How many people have believed here? Okay, for those that are raising your hand, this isn't a trick question, okay? If you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ without seeing him, that's faith. Hebrews 11.1 says, faith is an assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not yet seen. And it says in Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and then he's a rewarder of those who, who, who seek him, right? And so what it's saying there is what the essence of our faith is, it's believing in one we haven't seen yet. And that's what faith is, and that's what faith demands. It's interesting. Peter said this, 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, and though you have not seen him, talking to disciples, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you what? You believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So Jesus says you want to be blessed? You want to have blessing in your life? 
than believe in Jesus without having to visibly see him. Now, does that mean, does that, mean that he's not real because we don't see him? No. Many of us can give the reality of Jesus Christ and the validity of Jesus Christ just in the way that Jesus has changed our lives. Just as the way that Jesus' spirit has blown into our lives and, and it's transforming us. Remember what Jesus said about the spirit? He says, just as you don't see the wind, you could feel the wind. And just as the spirit moves in our lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ, you feel, you feel the presence of Jesus, don't you? And so that's, that's what we have. We can't see Jesus, but we can experience him. And how does our faith get strengthened again? It's through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ and receiving him into our lives and believing in him. And as we do that, just as the wind blows and we can feel the wind, we can experience Jesus Christ through what he does in our lives and changes our lives. And as we behold his face, we see him in all his glory. We see him through that relationship and then we're changed from glory to glory into his image. Amen? So let's close up our story with Thomas here. Good stuff here. It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What was the purpose of John in writing the Gospel of John? to talk about all the glories of the miracles of Jesus Christ and to speak of Jesus so that people would believe in Jesus Christ and have life in his name. That's why I believe if you have someone that's doubting, if you have someone that needs to come to faith in Christ, if you have someone that's struggling in faith, one of the best books you could point them to is this book we're studying right now. And as they study the Gospel of John, it will point them to Jesus Christ. It will help them to believe in Jesus Christ and it will help them to have life in the name of Jesus Christ. And how do I know that? Because 38 years ago, my friend that was witnessing got tired of my arguing and my, my lack of faith and not believing in Jesus. And I'll never forget, he challenged me. He said, John, okay, I'll stop witnessing to you. I'll, we'll stop this discussion for a while. You just read the Gospel of John. Read it for a month. And I did. And I read a chapter a night. I'll never forget, I was 17 years old. I read a chapter a night for a month. First couple, two, three nights, I go, what is this all about? Beginning was a word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became, I didn't understand any of it. it. Didn't make sense to me at all. But I kept reading, chapter a night for a month. And I started reading about miracles, about Jesus turning water into wine about Jesus knowing things about a woman by a well that no one would know unless he was, had this supernatural ability. I started reading things about fishes and loaves. And I started reading things about, you know, Lazarus being raised from the dead. And as I read that, it captivated me. But not only did it captivate me, I started, Jesus started becoming alive. And by the time I got to John chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 21, guess what happened? I got saved. I went from darkness to light. And as John, Jesus talked about in John chapter 3 about being born again, I got born again. The Spirit of God came into my life. And all of a sudden, this Bible that seemed so foreign to me, it was like words were leaping off the page because the Spirit was now teaching me. And I was beginning this relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. No greater thing. I could, I could relate to Paul who said, nothing compares to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Nothing. Nothing compares. And so, if you're doubting, if there's crisis going on, if there's faith issues going on, what do we learn this morning? First of all, we learn, we, we learn it's okay. It's okay to have questions. God can handle your questions. Go to his throne of grace with those questions. Amen? Not only that, we learned this morning, hey, don't fall out of fellowship just because there's some crisis going on, some circumstances going on. If anything, when your faith is lacking and needing bolstering, stay in fellowship, keep in fellowship, get around some Christians that can stimulate you to love and good deeds, right? Because where two or three are gathered, what did Jesus say? I'm there. I'll be present, and I'll meet with you. Also, realize sometimes there's some good reads out there that we could be reading that apologetically defend our faith and give evidence for our faith. Get into some books like that if you need some strengthening in your faith. Realize, too, 
the one we believe in says we're blessed if we believe without having to see. Because faith is an assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of things not yet seen. Amen, church? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you, God, for just the interchange that Jesus had with Thomas. And we thank you that Thomas uh, went from a skeptic to a believer as he saw the resurrected Christ, as he had the privilege of having that evidence of putting his fingers through his nail-pierced hand and sword-pierced side, as he, as he hit the deck and said, my Lord and my God. And Father, I, I thank you for Jesus' words that says that we're blessed if we believe this without even having to see. I love what Jesus said there in regards to that. Uh, blessed are, are you because you've seen times, but blessed are those who haven't seen, yet they believe. And so, Father, we say in our unbelief at times, help us to be people of belief, God. Bolster our faith. And, Father, as we're around each other, Lord, we, may we be contagious with our faith. May, may there be a stimulation to love and good deeds as we meet in your name, God. May we be people that are spurring one another on, God, to be those people you've called us to be, God. And as we go into this new school year coming up, God, may we be people that impart faith to other people because we walk with you, God. Father, thank you so much that you've given us a purpose, and that is not only to be people of faith, but people that pass our faith on to other people, God. Thank you for that purpose, Lord. Thank you that we are fishers of men as we follow Jesus Christ. So give us that vision of people around us that we could pass faith on to, Lord. And help us to be busy about that even this week, Father. Thank you so much, Father, for the way that you use us for your kingdom and your glory, God. Thank you that we could be a church that's a city set on a hill, uh, a light to a, to a world that's desperately dark. Give us some opportunities this week just to shine our lights into some people's lives, and into some people's darkness, God. May we do that with your love and your grace and your truth, Lord. Thank you for your word too, Lord, that just imparts faith to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Lord, you're so good to us. We have tasted and seen that you are good. And blessed are we because we put our trust in you, Lord. And I, I pray that you help us even this week to be people of faith, people that have that assurance, that hope, because we walk with Jesus. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,